Hey there, I'm Elonzo DeVette, and firstly, let me thank you for watching. I'm here to let you know that you are tuned in to another faith-filled message here from us at Cole Ministries, and I pray that you will stay tuned to allow your spirit to be edified, exhorted, and comforted by the word of the Lord that you're about to hear. God bless you. Hey, welcome back. This is Elonzo DeVette, and we are in the studio about to continue our lesson on the fundamental doctrines or elementary principles of our faith in Jesus Christ, as Paul has uh, told us, or can't say Paul, I don't know who the writer of Hebrews is, but the writer of Hebrews says in verse one of Hebrews chapter six, therefore, leaving the principles of doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. And so we've done these or we've taught on these two things already. He says the foundation of repentance from dead works. And so we've done that series as we've been getting through these uh, principles of doctrine. And we've also done a series on faith toward God. And so, I mean, pretty much all of my videos can fall into that category of faith toward God. But uh, there's something that I um, have been studying for a while. I listened to um, Fred Price, I believe senior. I don't know if he's a bishop or apostle, but Fred Price senior, I wanna, I'll say pastor, cause I'm sure he's a pastor. Pastor Fred Price senior had a crazy revelation on faith. And as I was listening to him, the Lord started to reveal things to me even as well. And so I was made a series teaching on what Fred Price has taught on, teaching on faith um, from what the Holy Spirit was talking to me about it as well. And so if you haven't watched any of my videos about faith, I would, uh, urge you to please, you know, pause this one and just go find them, go and look at them. I have, I think two or three separate series is, uh, series is, I think series is already plural, but one of them was when I was first listening to Fred Price and he gave me the, uh, the revelation on thinking of faith as a currency even deeper than I've ever heard it. And then I, um, after meditating on that for a while, I also taught, a new series on faith and using the same principles that are the same revelation, but just further expounding upon it from um, faith being what manifests the promises of God. And it goes even beyond faith and belief being synonymous, but they are not the same thing. Nevertheless, I can't get into that. That's not what this teaching is about. So let's pick up in verse two of Hebrews chapter six. It says, and of the doctrine of baptisms. Now we went over that as well. We've discussed the doctrine of baptisms. Notice that that word is plural. And so we went pretty in depth on that in a teaching that is up on um, YouTube. It's up on Cole Ministries. And now we are about to discuss. And by no means are we about to thresh this out completely or fully. You know, Revelation is revelation. It continues. Not that there's new revelation, but the Holy Spirit, I, the way I heard it the best is like the word of God is like a prism. And so the Holy Spirit can reveal this, this one detail to somebody from this angle, but to someone else from this angle, and then from somebody else from this angle. And so anything that I'm teaching, I'm, I'm by no means am I saying this is the teaching. This is the understanding. Because even what I'm about to discuss is, are things that I've seen in the Bible that's already taught from what is written, and then things that I've heard or experienced that are biblically sound from just other ministers. And so today we are going to be venturing into what does the doctrine, or I'll say this way, what is the principles of the doctrine of laying on of hands? And so we're in this, um, I can't even say, there's nothing new under the sun. I was going to say charismatic era that's kind of like coming again or coming around. But I mean, it's, it's been here. People have been making fun of it longer than I knew what the truth was. I mean, people have been in ministry longer than I've been alive, obviously, and they've been doing this thing the right way longer than I even knew the truth. <clears throat> But um, what I'm teaching us, what we're about to go over are things that I've seen, things that I've witnessed from ministers or ministries, or these are the type of people, the men and women of God, 
where the Bible says to imitate those who through faith and patience have obtained the promises of God. These are the people I learned from and I name drop them as much as I possibly can. But I, I kind of studied more on what uh, Apostle Didio is literally did EO, what he taught his uh, people about this. And um, so that we don't continue into yapping, let's go ahead and pray and then we'll dive into this thing. Heavenly Father, thank you for the hearts and the minds that have decided to come and learn from what you have to share with us through your humble servant here in this video. Lord, give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and a heart to understand the revelation behind your word. Father God, reveal these things to us through your Holy Spirit, so that with revelation and faith, as we believe the word, we can go forward and produce a harvest with what is being sown from the word of God, from this teaching lesson. In Jesus' almighty name, amen. All right. The doctrine or the principles of doctrine of laying on of hands. Now, I'm sure all of us kind of know what laying on of hands is, and or maybe not, maybe we don't. Let me teach it in such a way where we don't know what laying on of hands is then. And so if that's the case, turn with me to Mark chapter 16. One of the best things to do when you're teaching the anything from the New Testament is to see well what expectation did the New Testator establish or what did Jesus talk about this subject? What does Jesus have to say about laying on of hands? And so we look at Mark chapter 16. Out of this gospel, the great commission is given in this way. Excuse me. And let's start with verse 15. Jesus said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that does not believe will be damned. 17 says, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils or in his name, cast out devils. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. Uh, now I'll repeat that. They shall, or say this way, say, I shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. And so as Jesus is sharing this expectation, he shares about five things here, what he expects people who believe to operate in or to exercise. And so not to repeat everything we see here, he expects us to lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. And so I want to get ahead of myself because it's, you know, if you've ever done math, you think like, hey, if you show me how to use the formula, then I would know how to attack this situation. Or if I, if I saw the formula, then I could tell from this word problem where to put everything. But I don't know what formula to use. But I'm going to give you the, the formula. I'm, go I'm going to give you the solution first. And then let's look at everything that we are about to look at from the lens of knowing what the solution is. Right. And that's why I started with the expectation of Jesus. Now that we know the expectation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you know, I believe he's a, uh, a very credible source here when it comes to understanding what the Bible uh, says or what God expects from us. Jesus Christ. Right. Once we know or now that we know what Jesus expects, we can read everything and understand these things from the lens of I've been commissioned as a believer as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus, to do these things. And what makes laying on hands even more significant is, well, this isn't like uh, speaking in tongues. I believe in speaking in tongues, but I'm saying this for a reason. This isn't like how when we, when we speak in tongues and people can say, well, Jesus never spoke in tongues. Well, speaking in tongues was not necessary for the ministry of Jesus Christ, nor was it necessary to prove that he was the Messiah. Nevertheless, he made it necessary for us. This is why we speak in tongues. But we can look at the ministry of Jesus and see him even operating in laying hands on the sick and the sick recovering. And so let's this let's establish a definition of what is the laying on of hands. And you can even say this way, the laying on of holy hands. Right. Because this is a this is a message for believers. This is a message for Christians. And so if we want to put a definition on this, 
The laying on of hands or holy hands is when one touches another in order to bring about, deliver or establish some spiritual purpose. Again, when one touches another in order to bring about or deliver or establish some spiritual purpose. And so what Jesus has shared with us here out of his expectation for his disciples out of Mark 16, verse 18, the spiritual purpose that we establish, or I'll say it this way, a spiritual purpose that we can establish by the laying on of hands is healing the sick. And so this is this is very key. This is very poignant. This is probably the most we see our main purpose of laying on hands is for the healing of those who are sick. And I want to um, I want to bring this up. I probably say this often enough, but I, I want people to understand this whenever we are reading about how do we exercise our faith or act in accordance with the expectation of God over our lives. Why do we lay hands? Right. Well, to put it one way. The same reason that we take communion is the same reason why we lay hands. The same reason why we pray is the same reason why we lay hands. The same reason that we get baptized is the same reason why we lay hands. And that reason is because God has told us in his word that if we do this practical action, then we would be using our faith, which commits God to accomplish some spiritual purpose. And so we use our faith when we are obeying God's word and doing the practical actions, the diligently seeking portion of the word of God. Once we exercise that, that then commits or it passes it off to God. It's like we're giving God faith and in return for giving God faith, which pleases him out of Hebrews 11 and 6, what God then does is by his virtue by his power, by his, his mighty hand, he comes and he accomplishes some promise that he has given us out of the word. And so if you talk, if you, you know, see, seen, listen to our teaching on faith or listen to the teaching on the doctrine of baptism, you will see that being baptized is a practical action that we do, but it accomplishes a spiritual purpose or it's for a spiritual purpose that God comes and accomplishes on behalf of us, the faithful. And I, I bring that up because it is so important to use faith. And I, I don't want to get into the full teaching of this thing, but just because you believe doesn't mean that you're using faith or, or just, even just because you say you have faith, you claim that you, it, it doesn't mean that you are actually pleasing God. And so receiving the promises of God is all that stuff is done by faith. And the thing about it is it's a three legged stool because faith works by love and love is proven, proven by obedience. Right. And in order to use faith, you have to use faith in obedience to the word of God. And so faith can't actually be put into practice. You can't actually exercise faith unless you first know the will of God and you have to know the will of God in order to believe the will of God. And if faith works by love, you have to actually do what God's telling you to do for his glory, for his namesake. And that proves our love to him. And that love being proven through our obedience causes faith to work, which pleases the Lord. And then God comes and fulfills his promise. And so that being said, we see in scripture, because if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans uh, 10, 17, if I'm wrong, I apologize. Romans says, Romans 10 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so in order for us to have faith, which is what receives from God, okay, this thing called faith, it, it faith begins, I forget who said this, faith begins where the will of God is known. And so I cannot be operating in faith if I do not know the will of God. That being said, once the will of God is known, what do I do? With this knowledge, I obey the will of God. I believe, I'll say this, so you have to believe it and you have to obey it. Believe it and obey it. And once you believe it and obey it, that that together is an is it is you exercising or putting forward faith. Faith is the foundation of what we cannot see, it's the foundation of what we're hoping for. It, it, it literally think about this. 
a foundation is laid before something can come and be built. But when you see the trees being clear, when you see the dirt bounds stacking up and they're they're making a flat land and they come with the concrete and stuff and they lay a foundation, that foundation is proof that something is going to be there. It's a sign that something is about to be established. And so when we're using our faith, we, we establish that foundation for God to come and put something on top of. And glory to God, he tells us what, what is he going, he tells us what he's going to build on that foundation, right? And so think of faith that way. And so when Jesus says, lay hands on the sick, if I believe that and I do that, right? I first believe it, then I willingly obey it. Now I'm using faith for God to do what? Well, the word told me, the sick shall recover. And so in me practically putting my hands on someone, having in mind the spiritual purpose of Jesus said, if I do this, this person will be healed. So I do the practical action. Then God's power flows through me. That virtue flows through me because I've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's a caveat, but I'll get into that after this. Flows through me and it's God's power that comes or flows and accomplishes the healing of the sick. And Jesus tells us they shall recover. So there is no doubt about it. The expectation is if I do this thing, they will, they will, what's the word? That's not indefinitely. They will without a doubt, but it's another word. Is it indubitable? Anyway, it's without a doubt. There's no, shall is a definite thing. It's going to happen. And so I know it's going to happen. I believe it's going to happen because that's what the word of God says. And so I do this practical action. And that practical action commits God's power to be sent, to flow, or to, 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 us, to come and establish, to come and accomplish the rest of it, the fulfillment of the sick being healed, made whole, recovering. And so I... Um, You can even break this down into further detail, but let's say it this way. Let's put a, a heading over this, right? So the way we see it executed in the word, which we're about to get into deeper, is that when we lay hands, right, we're accomplishing some spiritual purpose. You know, we keep in mind that the laying on of hands is a holy thing. Now, it can be unholy, depending on who's laying hands on you. But for Christians, this is a holy thing that we do in faith in order to, to, uh, to establish, deliver, or bring about some spiritual purpose. Now, I already shared with us that, you know, from Mark 16, that a spiritual purpose of laying on of hands is healing the sick, but you can categorize this thing as a word that we say in the church setting, and that word is impartation. And so um, I could probably look up the definition of impartation if it's a real word, but let's look up impart, right? The definition of impart is, um, here we go, to communicate or make known. All right, let me get a figurative definition. You know, anyway, figuratively speaking, right? To impart something means that I am giving this thing. I, it's a transfer, right? And so we lay hands for impartation. And I say it's a heading because healing is an impartation. And so you're giving somebody something that they don't have, but it is in you. How is healing in me? Well, I've received healing because I received Christ through the indwellment or the, the filling of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead if he lives in you or if he's in you, he will then quicken, which means to make alive your mortal body. And so this is a mortal body right here, but it's filled with the Holy Ghost. And so this mortal body has been quickened. And so what the Holy Spirit has, you know, this is the power of God. This, th this, is, this is the executioner of the power of God. He's alive on the inside of me. And so what he has, it's flowing through me. And so out of me, these things can flow. Even, I'll say it this way, even if I might not necessarily be flowing into this thing, the Holy Spirit through me can still impart something into somebody. But I don't, I don't want to get too ahead of myself there because I, I want to I teach this. I want to break this down piece by piece. 
<clears throat> so I don't want to get taken too far away. But again, this is no concise teaching. This is not a concise teaching. So please, you know, look further into these things yourself or by looking, listening to other people's videos. And so then what do we impart by the laying on of hands? Now, one of the things we've already discussed is healing. We'll go a little further in depth on that in a second. But another thing that we can impart by the laying on of hands is the Holy Ghost, which we were just talking about, which is a very significant thing. And then we can also, as we see it in the Bible, impart blessing. And so impartation uh, can be summed up. I'll say this way, summed up in the Holy Ghost, impart the Holy Ghost, impart blessing, impart healing. And then there's even a, a, a further, further detail we see in healing is that it it's impartation of life, right? Because if you're if you're imparting the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost comes alive on this side of you, and He quickens, He brings you to life. And so, um, I, uh, Apostle Didio talked about that in further detail in the video that I watched, and I really liked how he put that. And he even um he even said a, a part uh, a reason for laying on of hands is to uh, confirm something. It is to impart something and then it is to ordain, which is our last point that I want to bring up. And so I, was, I just want to talk about impartation and ordination, though. And so we see mainly we lay hands on people to impart and to ordain. And so you can break the impartation down, which is what we're about to do into further detail, which is imparting the Holy Ghost, imparting blessing or imparting life slash healing slash wholeness, you know, all that that goes together with that. And so let's go further into detail on healing, though. We already started in Mark 16, verse 18, where Jesus expects his disciples. So if you're a disciple of Christ and you're not laying hands on people, well, Jesus wants you to lay hands on people for the reason of this. It is so the sick shall recover. So there are, are honestly many things that Jesus, that Earl, that God gives us to receive healing. Now, one of those things, not only Christ being beaten for the purpose of by his stripes, we were healed. We see that even laying on of hands is, don't want to get into that. Let's read scripture and then we'll get into that. So turn with me. We've already read Mark 16. Let's look at Luke chapter four. So Jesus is starting ministry, right? You know, he's come out of the wilderness full of the Holy Ghost and power. And he delivers that amazing uh, statement in verse 18. And he continues on from there. He goes to Capernaum. And then, um, let's see, let's see. He's teaching in synagogues. And then we see, let's look at verse 40. Now, he, well, before this, we just get uh, finished with seeing that Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law. And we get to verse 40 and it says, now, when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases, they brought them to Jesus. So anybody that, that knew someone that was sick, they brought that sick person to Jesus. It says, and Jesus laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Pause. He laid his hands on all of them. And through that laying on of hands, they received healing. So what did he impart by the laying on of hands? He imparted healing to the bodies of the sick. So we see Jesus is doing something now. He's demonstrating now what he expects us to continue to do after him. Right. And so verse 41, let's keep reading. It says, and devils also came out of many crying out and saying that you are the Christ, the son of God, speaking of Jesus. And Jesus rebuked them, or Jesus rebuking them, suffered them not to speak for they knew that he was the Christ. Glory to God. And so when Jesus begins to even start his ministry, I should have looked up where this verse is, but he gets to, um, I think his hometown. And let's actually look it up. Let's look it up. Because I don't want to make this a casual thing. Turn with me to Matthew 13, verse 58. I believe this is where it is. Unless I looked it up too fast. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yes. So 
My, uh, Matthew 13, verse 54, we'll start there. It says, and when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue insomuch that they were astonished and said, where has this man or whence have this man this wisdom and these mighty works? So like, where do you get this from? It says, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? It says, whence then has this man all these things? Speaking about, about the wisdom and the mighty works, because Je Jesus is full on acting out as Messiah now. These people have seen him grow up and all this stuff. And they're like, wait, who is this guy? Isn't this isn't this him? What, what is like, who is what this, this can't be the same guy, but this is the same guy. Right. And so verse 57, and they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works because of their unbelief. He was not able to do mighty works because of their unbelief. So I actually want to read this in a, a, the other, except, lay hands. Let's look at this same story from Mark 6. This is where we really wanted to go. Mark chapter 6. Let's start in verse 4. But Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. Verse five. And he could do there no mighty works except that he lay his hands upon a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. And so I, I wanted to get to this part. It's so significant. Now, we, we read out of Matthew. We just read it here in Mark. Jesus could not do anything mighty because people were in unbelief. And so the laying on of hands is not even a mighty. I, the, the, the disciples, Mark said this, Apostle Matthew, he, he said the same thing, that Jesus could do no mighty works. But Mark shared with us, but he was still able to lay hands upon a few sick people and those people were healed. And so laying on is it's not complicated. You just boom, be healed, right? It's even you can you can pray it. Uh by laying on hands, Lord, you know, impart healing to this body. You can make it a little more in-depth, but you, the Bible tells us, it's showing us here, you know, what's clearly shown is not always clearly um discerned, or it's not always clearly seen, even though it's clearly shown. But laying on of hands is not a mighty work, it's a practical action. And when you do this practical action, it is guaranteed to bring about healing. Now, it doesn't necessarily say when, but we see in the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus and the disciples, when they lay hands on people, it's an immediate thing. And though I'm sure there were parts where there wasn't. I believe um, it's in the book of John, but I could be wrong. I should look this up, but I'm not going to. Jesus has to pray for someone twice. For his, his seeing. But the thing was, he was blind. The first time Jesus prayed for him, he's like, hey, can you see? It was like he saw men as trees. But Jesus, the same day, prays for the man again. Then his, his sight is completely restored. And so the thing about this, the promise on, the promise of laying on of hands is that these people will be healed. And so I've heard a minister say, say about this specific verse that just the laying on of hands might even just be forcing the healing onto somebody. Or I'll say that I'll say it this way, because I'm sure he said more than this, what I can remember. It just it was around that context where it when even when people don't believe, you can still lay hands on them. I think that's what he was trying to say. It, it, even when people aren't believing for the mighty, laying on of hands is a thing that you can do. It's a practical action that you can do. And then now God has to come because you did the practical. God has to come and accomplish the supernatural behind it, which is healing that person because you lay hands on them. And so if you are the person that's been, um, what's the word, given the authority to lay hands in whatever situation or meeting or whatever it is, right? If, 
if you've been given the authority to be the one to lay hands on people, you should have the faith that if I lay hands on, on you, when you lay hands on this person, they have to be made whole because that's what that's what the word says. And we even see when people were in unbelief in Nazareth, Jesus could do no mighty works. But the thing was, he was still able to lay his hands upon a few sick people and he was able to heal them because he could lay hands on them, even though the people didn't believe mightily. And so I've heard it that way. <clears throat> and then I've also heard it. I think uh, Pastor Didio was talking about it from this lens. That um, there were people that that believed. So these people did have faith. In a sense. Right. And they allowed for Jesus to lay his hands on them. And because they they got into agreement with the Jesus laying hands on them, they were still able to receive and even keep the healing that comes with laying hands because i mean the thing is even if you do believe well if i lay hands on this person they have to be healed well yes well will that person keep the healing is a different situation because you you can't have faith for someone else's complete wholeness so to speak where they have to live that thing out right his mercy is, is new every morning it, healing is the children's bread right and uh the bible says give us today our daily bread and, and i'm just saying all that to say you what yesterday's bread is not enough for today, so to speak. I mean, that's a, a phrase that you can look at. And I've heard it ministers say it in a biblical context, right? Because it's a daily bread and healing is daily bread. And so you might not be with this person all the time. You're not a good luck charm. And so you have to, in order for a person to basically keep what they receive from God, they have to continuously have faith in it. And so your faith in the moment might have been enough, right? It might have been enough to accomplish the healing in a moment, Right? Your practical action of laying on hands could have accomplished the healing in a moment. But what happens when the person is like, oh, I just hope I can keep it. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, Pastor Didio taught it from this perspective where it was like these people believed enough to to allow this point of contact. I like that. I like that a lot. He used this verse to explain that this is a point of contact. So this this. Laying on of hands is a point of contact. And I'm not, I don't remember if he brought this verse up, but I've, I've uh, meditated on this before and I like him establishing it or coining the phrase for this as a point of contact. I mean, he didn't come up with that phrase, but it is true. It is a point of contact. And why is that so important? Well, let's turn to a specific verse. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Let's look at verse 19. I remember we're talking about point of contact. So Jesus is talking to his disciples. A lot of you might be familiar with this chapter. And if we look at verse 19, Jesus tells them, Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And so looking at what uh, Apostle Didio was teaching from this, adding this verse to it, right? This whole point of contact. We see that the laying on of hands could potentially, and I, I do believe this to be true, could potentially be a, a moment of here in Matthew 18, 19, to touching and agreeing concerning anything that they are asking here on earth. And so when we lay hands on people, that is touching and agreeing. And so then it guarantees whatever uh, the people are asking for. And so now I want to bring up this story. And so uh, I listen to Pastor Ted Shuttlesworth Jr. a lot, and he tells a story about how he was so fascinated as a kid growing up in ministry or growing up around ministry, his father being, uh, you know, Prophet Ted Shuttlesworth Sr. And so he's always in meetings and uh, he even got the opportunity to uh, be in meetings and I think even travel with R.W. Schambach. And nevertheless, right, so he's around a bunch of music. You know, we have church services, there's music, there's praise going on. And so he was so fascinated with the keyboard, so fascinated with the organ, so fascinated with the piano. And like, he would be in services and he would be so close to the piano till eventually he got so much favor that people would let him sit on the uh, bench with him while they were playing the piano. Uh, and it's, But nevertheless, right, he was in a meeting one day, R.W. Schambach, and R.W. Schambach, does not play the piano. However, R.W. Schambach was full of the Holy Spirit. And so 
uh, he gets to the point where he's about to lay hands and pray for uh, Ted Jr. And he kind of tells him something along the lines of, I don't remember verbatim, so you just ask him about the story, message him or something on Instagram. But he says it, it was so divine. It was so supernatural because <laughs> I think this is where he even teaches. This is where he learned this as well. Now I learned it from him. That when you lay hands on people for impartation, you can also impart things that you might not even be operating in or flowing in. Because R.W. Schambach doesn't didn't play the piano. I don't even know if he knows how to play the piano. But nevertheless, he, he laid hands on, on Pastor Ted during that time. And that was a form of Matthew 18, 19. Two people, they touched and agreed. And so because he laid hands with the, with the spiritual purpose of God imparting the, the wisdom, the revelation, the, the gift to play the uh, piano unto Ted Jr., that is exactly what Ted Jr. received. And he'll tell you this. He says this all the time. He did not take piano lessons. He didn't go to piano school. Literally, the Holy Spirit taught him from that moment of him, hands being laid on him. And they agreed that that was what he was being blessed with, right? That lay hands on people, you can impart a blessing. He was blessed with the gift to play the piano because that's what they touched and agreed on. And if you know anything, I mean, this man of God was just invited to the biggest church building over in Abuja, Nigeria, uh, with, uh, is it Apostle? Yeah, I think, or Paul and Eche. And he, the, literally, I mean, that's a big man. That's a, that's a man of God, among men of God. That's a man of God, right? But he invited Pastor Ted to his congregation, to his church, to play for 100,000 people at once. That's how great that gift in him is. He even said it, he likened it until it, um, he sat in a meeting at one I had seen in Pittsburgh with Pastor Jonathan Shuttlesworth and Pastor Ted, Pastor Ted was playing and uh, Paul Inente was there. And he got up and he said, man, uh, Pastor Ted's playing. He said it, it felt like a Ken of Hagen meeting. Now, this is a man that never took piano lessons from any natural person. That was something that was imparted into him and the Holy Ghost taught him supernaturally how to do that. And he understands all the math stuff about it. The, the hey, take me to this key, whatever, right? He, he knows how to do all of those things. But look how crazy that is. R.W. Shambach well, didn't play the piano, from what I know. But he imparted that gift into Pastor Ted because they touched and agreed about that. And God established it. So that point of contact, what it did was it imparted a blessing into Pastor Ted. And people might teach that a different way, but you get the you get the point, right? You get the gist of what I'm saying, right? So when you're laying hands for impartation, if someone's believing for something, just be, boom, lay of hands. We touch and agree about it right now. God's going to do it now. And you'll see ministers are there. They are getting to the point where they're actually ministering to people. You see, there's like thousands of people, hundreds of people in their meeting, right? Fire of God, filled, healed. They just lay hands on people. Unless they, they'll stop and get a word and they'll release the word if they get a word or whatever. You know, you see it all the time. But why is it that they just go towards some people and they just go, or they just lay hands and move on? Or they, you know, they, they say whatever they say and then move on. They don't stop and give this full word because the Holy Ghost isn't talking. Well, because the thing is, if we, if we have this understanding that the laying on of hands is a uh, point of contact for two people touching and agreeing, as it says in Matthew 18, 19, then all you need to do, as this man of God is believing the Lord to, to, to what's, what do we say here from the definition? To bring about, to establish or deliver. If you're believing God to, to bring about, establish or deliver whatever you're believing for, when that man of God touches you, you say, I'm getting it. He's touching and agreeing with me right now. And what I'm believing for, whether God reveals that to that person or not. You know, you, if you have in your, if you're in your spirit, right? When this man lays hands on me, if you want to get hands laid on you, right? If you have the faith for that, when, when this is him touching and agreeing with me. And God is going to deliver from this point of contact what I'm believing for. And then even as a minister, when you're in a situation like that, you know, don't be afraid to just, you know what I'm saying? Because you don't want to force a word. 
I know people love getting words. I love getting words from the Lord through somebody. But you don't have to force it. I mean, you can get a testimony just as much from revealing to somebody the wisdom or plan of God for their life and all that stuff. The word of, word of knowledge, word of wisdom is what I meant to say. As just, boom, be healed. What happens when you, you, you don't have to, I don't want to downplay anything. So I'm not going to say it that way. That would have been a bad way of putting it. But if you just simply believe, because I, I mean, it should be enough for us where Jesus says, if I lay hands on somebody, they shall be healed. If I see someone sick, even if I don't know what's wrong with them, even if, even if it hasn't been revealed to me what's wrong with this person. But if I can tell they're sick, if when I lay hands on them, it doesn't matter what it is. I'm, if you haven't heard this before, you need to hear it now. The name of Jesus is above every name, everything on earth, everything in heaven, everything under the earth has to bow at the mention of the name of Jesus. And so sickness has a name. And whatever the name of that sickness is, has to bow at the mention of the name of Jesus, the name above every name. So in the name of Jesus, be healed. Doesn't matter what the sickness is. It has to bow. And so even if you don't, I mean, you see ministers operating the word of knowledge to be able to tell somebody what the, what is wrong with them. Well, that's something that they receive from years of diligently seeking, right? And ministering. <clears throat> but don't be discouraged if you're not flowing like that. You sh it should be enough to you believe that if I lay hands on this person, they are supposed to be healed. That's a promise of God. Even if you don't know what is necessarily going on, going on with them, just believe that. Believe that. So the, you should be laying hands on people if you're a minister. And uh, I don't remember who said it because I, I listen to these guys all the time. And I, I, I mean, they honestly, sometimes they're flowing in the same direction a lot. And I listen to one of them and I listen to the next one. I don't know if they listen to each other, but it's like they're talking about the same thing, essentially. <clears throat> what a bunch of stories to tell. But. I want to say it was Pastor Ted was talking about this the other day where uh, there was a, a big name minister. And he had been in ministry for decades. And the Lord told him one day, actually, you're not even a minister. And the Lord told him this long story short, because this guy didn't lay hands or he didn't pray for the sick is what the story was. But the thing was, if, if you don't pray for the sick, you definitely don't lay hands on people. Because we see Jesus says you lay hands on the sick so that they can be healed. And so <clears throat> this guy was not praying for the sick. And God tells that guy one day, you're not actually even a minister because ministers, Jesus expects us all disciples. So if he expects all disciples, he said, these signs shall follow those that believe. So that's to all the people that would ever bear the, the title of Christian. Right. He expects all of us to do those things. And so if you are if you are not as a minister doing those things, and that's actually crazy. But, but I mean, that was a story. And so nevertheless. Right. You, you, I'm, I brought that up to say you do not want to neglect this. It's such a simple thing. It's not a mighty work. So how how, how much should we be willing to do that? All I literally have to do is touch somebody. With holy hands. And if they're sick, they'll be made whole. Whatever they're believing for from God, God will deliver unto them because it's a point of contact of us touching and agreeing. It's a practical action that commits God to accomplish the impractical. It's so simple. And we can go into story after story, right? Or scripture after scripture is really what I was thinking. Like even James chapter five, let's see verse 16. I, I like this a lot because it puts what we were just talking about all together, laying hands, praying for people. And so James tells us in verse 16. Actually, no, how can I? Skip? Let's start in verse 13. James asks, is any among you afflicted? Then let him pray. Is anybody married? Then let him sing. Is anyone sick among you? It says, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. It says, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. It says, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven of him. And James encourages this person that's sick. And you see, he's saying if the sickness is because of sin, 
You'll be forgiven. God will raise you up. You know, the prayer of faith, it will save this person. And he encourages whoever that is, right, by saying, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. This says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And that's so good. And so <clears throat> now this anointing him with oil part is a, is a great detail because you can see you you'll see this. Oftentimes that you can anoint with oil by just pouring it over somebody. You see that people also anoint with oil by literally they, they combine this stuff. Really, they put oil on their hands and then they lay hands on the person, anointing them with oil, laying hands on them, praying for them all in one boom. And <laughs> I mean, it's like a compound guarantee, really. But I like that a lot in this context of laying hands to impart healing onto somebody. And we were saying how that makes so much sense because it says that the Holy, the, let's get into that. Let's talk about impartation of the Holy Ghost. Now turn with me to Acts chapter eight. And let's skip down to verse 17. So long story short, Philip goes to Samaria, preaches Christ unto them, miracles start happening, and the people turn to the Lord. They all get baptized, but they don't get filled with the Holy Spirit. They don't get that baptism of the fire, right? So then uh, Philip or whoever sends for Peter and John. Then Peter and John pull up to the scene in Samaria. And because they see, it says in verse 15, they came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Check this out. So it says they prayed for them to receive the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost had not yet fallen upon any of them. They were only baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus. It says, then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. So first these guys pray, Lord, you know, what we're about to do, we want to impart the Holy Spirit unto them. Allow them to receive it, whatever they said, right? First they prayed for the people to be able to receive it. And then they laid hands on them and they did receive the Holy Ghost. And so we see even, you know, the sorcerer, if we keep reading this story, we see that the Holy Spirit was imparted. It says in verse 18, and when Simon saw that through laying on of hands or the apostles hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he wanted to pay for it. And I, I mean, that's so important because uh, Apostle Didio said this, like, hey, if you don't have virtue, don't go lay hands on people. Because that's the point of contact. And point of contact can flow two different ways. Now, greater is he that's alive on the inside of you. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about virtue. And so I like how this, this verse 18 points out. It was through the apostles' hands that the Holy Ghost came or was given. The apostles had virtue. They had the Holy Spirit. They had dunamis, right? That's the word virtue in uh, Mark 5. It's dunamis. These guys had power and they had the power that's greater than anything on the earth. Or in the earth, right? Oh, that's interesting. I'll talk about that another. I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit of what I just thought about. Uh, apparently, science has shown us that or science has a. Um, Proven that the moon is actually still in the Earth's atmosphere. There's like another layer or something. And so technically that would mean the moon is still in the Earth. And because of that, or anyway, you know, demons operate second heaven. If, if you know about that stuff, then put you can piece together what I was thinking about. This verse just made me think about that. Or the verse about anything, greater is he that is in me than him that is in the world. And the apostles had that that greater. They, they had the Holy Ghost. And so when they lay hands on people, it, it didn't matter what was in them. The Holy Ghost moved. It didn't matter what was in the person that they were laying hands on. Right. If there was still anything in them, you know, because Philip did a great job. He said they he cast out devils. People were healed. Miracles happened. But I, a fair warning, an, uh, you know, another key to imparting onto people. Don't go trying to impart. <laughs> If you don't have the Holy Ghost, because the thing is, R.W. RW Shamrock was able to impart something that he didn't necessarily have because he had the Holy Ghost. Even though R.W. Shamrock wasn't flowing in that way of being able to, do, 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 right? He, he he still had the Holy Spirit.
Glory to God. And so these guys had the Holy Spirit. And after these people were baptized in the name of Jesus, they were they were made candidates. Being baptized in the name of Jesus made them candidates to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And that's exactly what happened when the apostles laid their hands on these people. And then uh, let's even turn to the next chapter. Let's look at the same number verse, I believe. Look at, okay, so Acts chapter 9. Paul, Damascus, blind, go wait here. And then verse 17, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him. So we see, boom, laying on of hands. Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto you in the way as you came, Damascus, has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So what do we, what do we see here? By the laying on of hands, this is another key point to this impartation. Because if you impart healing, there's something that you're also doing. Because what is healing? It is a deliverance. So by the impartation of Ananias laying his hands, being filled with the Holy Ghost, sent of God to Paul, Paul was then delivered from blindness one. And then the Holy Ghost was then given to him all in that one motion. He was delivered from blindness and the Holy Spirit was delivered on the inside of him. And you can even probably think about it this way. But I mean, it's written, he, you receive your sight and be filled in the Holy Ghost. So maybe this was a simultaneous thing, right? This is what I want to talk about. And so it, it, why was it simultaneous? Because what happened when the Holy Ghost came into him? Now, Ananias obviously did this for the purpose because God sent him to do this for this purpose. The spiritual purpose was so that he can get his sight back and receive the Holy Ghost. And so, I mean, you can even see that. You could probably even see how faith operated also is when the Holy Ghost came into to, uh, Paul, the Holy Ghost quickened him. And his sight returned. Now, that's speculation, though. I'm not saying that's a real thing, but I'm just considering that. Like, imagine that. So if you were to teach people faith enough to what can be accomplished when you receive the Holy Spirit? Just imagine that. The blind see. Glory to God. So we see that this impartation of healing is deliverance. And you can even take it a step further. This impartation is also life. What do I mean there? Uh, what is it? Turn with me to. Let's try Mark 5. So we know uh, Jesus is walking and then I believe Jairus comes and he pleads with Jesus to come. Yes, because Jairus' daughter is sick and like she's on her final minutes. So Jesus is going to Jairus's house, you know, a leader of a synagogue. A woman with the issue of blood comes in, touches him in between that journey. And then after literally immediately after, immediately after that, people come from Jairus's house and say, hey, don't bother the master anymore. Your daughter is actually dead. There's no, there's nothing to do now. She's dead. But Jesus says, be not afraid, only believe. All right. And he suffered no man to follow him. This is verse 37, except for Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. 38 says, and he cometh into the house of the ruler of the synagogue. He saw a bunch of people. They were weeping. They were sad, right? He says, why do y'all make all of this? Why, why are y'all crying? What's up with all this noise? She's not dead, but she's asleep. They laughed and scorned Jesus. But he had put them all out. He had taken the father and the mother and the damsel, or of the daughter, and uh, took his disciples with him. And toward the girl was lying down and he goes, it says he took her by the hand point of contact now and said unto her. So he got rid of all the unbelief in the place one, which is I mean, this is probably pretty key because the thing is. We'll turn to Mark nine after this, but it was, the thing is. It seemed like Jesus had to use his faith here. And you could even say I'm reading too deep into this. But you see, there's something significant even still about, oh, Jesus touched somebody. It has to be significant because we just read 
in the same chapter, someone, when so, what happened when someone touched Jesus in faith, right? And so I, I, I can't really believe that I'm reading too deep into this because Jesus just touched this girl. And we just read about what happens when someone touches Jesus in faith. So now Jesus is touching this girl, this dead girl, or I'll say this way, this sleeping girl in faith and told her to leak the kumi which is to be interpreted as damsel, I say unto you, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years. It says they were astonished with great astonishment. And so we could even surmise that the laying on of hands also raises the dead. How can we say that? Well, if the spirit of that raised Christ from the dead, if he dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body. Glory to God. I mean, you even see this operate in the uh, in the Old Testament. I think it was Elijah laid down on a boy. Or I think it says that he stretched himself over the boy three times, and this dead boy was brought back to life. Point of contact. Boom. Laying on a man's. You could assume that's a part of stretching himself over the boy but that's that's so it's so important it's so key it's so good and we kind of already talked around blessing when it comes to laying on of hands but um can i think of a new testament example of this Man, I mean, I'm considering this as well. You remember when Peter cuts off this guy's ear when they come to get Jesus? It says Jesus picked the ear up and put it back on the guy. Even that point of contact, laying on of hands, this man's ear was healed. Quite literally laid hands on his ear and just put it back on his face. Insane. But I don't want to get too deep into this one about blessing. But I mean, it's all just from the flow of the Holy Ghost. It's a spiritual principle as well. And from the Old Testament, we see it in parts blessing. Because what happens when it's time for this son to receive an inheritance? They lay hands on him. That's what Jacob did. He took his brother's inheritance because he tricked our. Yeah, he tricked Isaac into laying hands on him instead of Esau. And I mean, principle for principle's sake, right? I, I, you would probably ask yourself, well, why didn't Isaac just take it back? Hey, he gave it to him. I mean, he imparted it. It wasn't his anymore. <clears throat> and so let's lastly, let's finish up the impartation with this because you can kind of talk around this all day. Mark 6, verse 2. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue and many hearing him were astonished, saying, from whence has this man these things? Right. We were talking about this earlier. And what wisdom is this which is given unto them that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? This impartation. It's, it's an insane thing. And so laying on, laying hands on the sick is not a mighty work. And, you know, we read about that in the other gospel. But the thing is, it's still through these hands that mighty works are happening through. And hands are also symbolic of power. It's like they're really asking, where did he get the power to do these things? How come this, the, the power to accomplish these things are, with, are within his grasp? And you read about the miracles of Jesus. We just read about how he literally raised somebody from the dead. Hey, boom. I mean, a similar story kind of happens in Mark chapter 9, where the boy has this demon. Jesus tells it, get out. Don't come back into him. Then the guy just goes limp. It says Jesus took him by the hand and he arose. People thought he was dead. He might have been dead. I mean, this is a crazy dude. The demon leaves him and he falls as one dead. 
And the similar thing that we saw happen in Mark chapter five with the with Jairus's daughter happens to the the boy in Mark chapter nine. And what? Let me read it. And straightway the father cried out. No, not this one. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead. In so much that many people said, "Dang, he is dead." But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Point of contact, laying on of hands. All right. Now let's get into the last one of these, and let's talk about ordination. So turn me to Acts chapter 6, and let's look at, wait, is it Acts chapter 6? Let me check this out really quickly. Yes, let's look at Acts chapter six, and then I think we'll. I want to go to Acts thirteen. So looking at six chapters, or no, looking at chapter six, verse one. I don't know why I always mess that up. All right, so verse one says, and in those days when the number of disciples was multiplied, those arose, or there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. All right. So then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, is it, or it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out among ye seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. I mean, see what the apostles were concerned with as ministers, praying and ministering the word. They didn't have the time to be settling this dispute. So they're appointing seven men who are, you know, they're good men, great men of God, full of the Holy Ghost to take care of these matters. Verse five says, and saying and this saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, check that out, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenus, or Parmenus and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And they appointed these men. This is not the verse, but they appointed these men as deacons. But we see by the laying on of hands, these men were ordained to be the deacons. So this ordination was them being set apart, lay hands on them, which set them apart to operate in a specific office. There was a grace given here, by the way. There was authority given here, by the way. And a similar thing happens in Acts chapter 13. So reiterating the whole ordination thing, which is laying hands on someone, which sets them apart, gives them the grace uh, and appoints them to do a specific thing. Right. Verse one of Acts 13 says, now there were in the church that was at Antioch, Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon. <clears throat> Verse two, <laughs> as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, oh, look at that. Separate me. See, see, see this. This ordination is a separate. It's a sanctification for a specific to, to, to operate in a specific office. He says, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work were until I have called them. And they and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And so you see the people that they were uh, ministering to the Lord with in Antioch. They weren't sent where Paul and Barnabas were sent to go do. They didn't they, they weren't call to flow into that direction, so to speak, or I'm saying that in that way on purpose. But nevertheless, the Holy Spirit flowed through them to give Paul and uh, Barnabas the grace to operate in the way that uh, the Holy Spirit called them to operate in, right? You see that? So kind of put, piecing that together with how Pastor Ted was given the grace to operate in the keyboard anointing. I, I know I said that weird, but it was through a man who doesn't even play the keyboard. But the thing was, this is what the Holy Spirit wanted to get done. It's what the Holy Spirit said to do. And he he accomplished that through a vessel, even though the vessel he accomplished it through was not able to do that said thing. And so an element that comes along with this whole ordination stuff, and this is where we're going to finish, is 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is very key. This is very important. And you look at verse 22. 
do we only look at verse 22? All right, yeah, just verse 22. So obviously Paul is talking to Timothy, son in the faith, pastor of a church. And he's basically encouraging him and telling him how to operate. And he says in verse 22, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep yourself pure. Drink no longer water. Uh, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. But looking at verse 22, obviously, right? And we see there's even a compound thing about this, because he's talking about laying hands on people to ordain them into ministry help, right? Like when we look at uh, Acts chapter, what was it? Six. Yeah, when we looked at Acts chapter six, well, there was a criteria for the men that they appointed as deacons to lay hands on them, right? They said they got to be a good report, full of the Holy Ghost. Something else. But, you know, mainly, right? Good report and full of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because the thing is, if you ordain somebody, if that person is an offender, if that person is an, an offender, you could be a partaker now of that man's sins. I mean, you see it tragically sometimes. Somebody's working for a church. Like they've ordained this guy. They've hired this person in a sense, right? And, you know, that's like a natural way of looking at this ordination, which is a supernatural means of calling somebody to operate in a certain way. But you see someone that's hired to work in a church in the natural, and this person does something stupid, right? Now the whole church is taking it for this one man's offense, or this one woman's offense, right? So you, you don't want to be a partaker in other people's sins. And so there's a criteria for people to be proven. I believe that. Yeah, yeah. That's literally the first couple of chapters. The criteria for these for these ministry helps. So don't hastily appoint someone who is an offender, even if you don't outwardly know. You just you, you're, you're cautious about these things because, it's you know, he told them, uh, what was it? Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before them, but some men's sins follow after. And so you, you want people to be tested and proven before you ordain them. And that's pretty much it. Oh, I have a joke. All right. Turn with me to uh, Numbers 13, 21. I, I was when I was reading the Bible the first time all the way through, this was so funny to me. So, you know, Nehemiah is about Nehemiah. Or I said numbers, but I meant Nehemiah. Nehemiah is about this guy named Nehemiah. And he's rebuilding the wall. Ezra's with him. But look what he said here in verse 21. Oh, wait, I'm in the wrong chapter. There we go. Nehemiah 13, verse 21. So he's talking to... I actually forgot the name of these guys. Is it Sam Ballot? Or I think it's someone specifically. Let's just look at verse 19. See, it looks like a paragraph here. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates that there should be no burden, that no burden should be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and the sellers of all kind of where it lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them and said to them, why lodge ye about the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth, they came no more on the Sabbath. So, I mean, just, you know, the law for the Sabbath is nobody can do any work. And so he purposely closed the doors for these merchants and sellers to not be able to get in and try to do stuff. But they kind of uh, lodged by the wall. And it said after a day or two, or maybe once or twice, I assume that's like a day or two. He goes and he tells them, if you guys don't move, I'm going to lay hands on you. I just thought that was funny because, you know, we, we were talking about how laying on hands is for such a spiritual purpose. But obviously he's talking about putting hands on them. 
If you ever had a time where you have to lay hands on somebody, please share in the comments. But all right, you guys, that's it. Honestly, I got to finish up anyway. There's some people getting loud in this space. So, uh, yeah, but may the Lord have opened your eyes to receive something today. As you watch this video, God bless you and keep you. So we've come to the end of this broadcast, and I want to thank you for watching. But if you're looking for more content, please visit us at koleministries.org and click the I'm ready button to let us know if you just got saved or you want to share a personal testimony. And if you want to partner with our ministry, find out how by clicking the give button on the same homepage. God bless you and keep you.